Okay, so last week we introduced the subject, right? The uh, mm -hmm. pre-trib rapture of the church. This ancient doctrine of the pre-trib rapture of the church. So sure enough, Joy having put that on the title, uh, of course, some people, uh, of course, begin to choke. Because again, you got to remember, number one, we live in a world today. We live in a world today that there are no absolutes. So if you stand for something dogmatically, then you're a nut. You're, you're a goofball. There's something wrong with you. You're, a, uh, you're, you're somebody to laugh at. Because again, everyone at large, for some, is totally accepted. Einstein and his theory of relativity, meaning that absolutely there are no absolutes, everything is relative. Well, now, of course, we can throw that back in these relativist space to say, well, if everything's relative, then the Bible really could be true, then now can it? It may not be that the sun is the center of any solar system. In fact, maybe it's all a geo system. Maybe it is just the way the Bible says it is. God made the earth and it is sitting perfectly still, and the sun is going around the earth. And the planets are going around the sun as it goes around the earth. And, of course, we know that all the scientific evidence says that's true. And, of course, the Bible says that's true. So now we've even got a new movie out called The Principle that shows clearly all these major atheistic physicists and scientists admitting that, yes, of course it's true. The Bible could, of course, 100% be true. Because if everything is relative, then for sure it's not the way Galileo said. And Galileo is the one that said, oh, we know that the Earth must be spinning in space and going around the uh, sun because, uh, oh, look at the tide. See how the tide sometimes is high tide, low tide? See, that's proof that the world's spinning and it's the water just sloshing back and forth. Well, every modern scientist, no, 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 no. The reason they're sized is not because of the stupidity of Copernicus or Galileo, but rather it's because of the moon. And it's the gravitational force of the moon. <laughs> but uh, so much for science, you know. So again, everything's relative today. There are no absolutes. So of course, if you're dogmatically teaching this ancient truth found in the Bible of what modern man calls a pre-trib rapture of the church, well, you got to be laughed at. You got to be scorned. And so Joy was reading me what some person wrote us to say. Um, He's just dogmatic, dogmatically stated that no one believes such a thing uh, before 1840. Well, what an idiot, because in my discussing, discussing this subject and introducing it last week, just introducing it, mm -hmm. I happen to mention Matthew Henry and how that we all know he wrote in 1709, <laughs> Matthew Henry, that great theologian that Charles Spurgeon said every pastor should have a set of his commentaries on the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. And I also just casually mentioned off the top of my cuff uh, Ephraim of Syria who wrote in 370 he wrote this great message all about how we you know that the Lord will come and, the, and rapture his church there uh, and have, have this church escape the way the Bible says that he would before the tribulation period so that the saints wouldn't have to go through this troublesome time. Yeah. Now, 370, I think, is sometime before 1840. <laughs> but see, it's so typical. Some punk somewhere, some smart aleck, thinks he's going to make fun of this old white haired man. This old white haired man don't know nothing. Well, oh yeah, I, I know a little something. See, that's what these people are so quick to do. They throw the baby out with a bathwater. It's like, uh, it's like there's never been a great man called uh, Sperry Chafer who wrote so many great theological works, a great theologian, a great mind. Uh, oh, he has to be an idiot too, you know. And it was, uh, you know, if anybody knows me, you know that I'm a great follower of uh, this guy on the radio called Alex Jones. And I love Alex Jones. I love him greatly. However, <laughs> he is not a theologian. He's not a preacher. So when he puts up a little video he made last week called The Rapture is a Lie, again, I can laugh at it because I know why he says such a thing. Because he honestly, he's just trying to help Christians be a little more balanced because so many Christians are so lazy. 
they use the vital uh, truth about the rapture to throw out the baby with the bathwater and thinking, well, somehow at churches that teach that, because again, a lot of the churches that are 501c3 government sponsored churches have taught it. And they have kind of taught it as a way to therefore just be lazy, don't get no guns, don't defend your family, don't get no uh, things prepared for anything because Jesus is going to catch us away here just for the hard times hit. Well, you know, we don't teach such a thing. In fact, if anybody needs the preparation, we do. And uh, of course, I've been a commander in the Michigan Militia Corps of Marines. Uh, we definitely need to be prepared. And we believe that's what the Bible teaches that we should be. So because some people use that as some lame excuse as very lame, um, there's no reason to reject Bible truth when it's Bible. It's ancient and it's Bible. It's as ancient as the Bible. So people who have used the Bible as a rolling rule of faith and practice means a lot. But now people that are looking for some excuse and want to look to men and say, well, show me any man that talks. Show me any. I don't go by any man teaching it. Why would I have fooled with that? Though again, I can still point to some pretty great men. <laughs> You know, you're, point, you're pointing to people like, like I said, my pastor, G.B. Vick, and before him, J. Frank Norris, and uh, all kinds of great men uh, that believed this and taught it. In fact, J. Frank Norris himself was running around over there in 1948 because Truman sent him on purpose, says, well, I want you to go over and come back and tell me what you think. And he come back and told him, and Truman, the uh, United States of America, got totally behind the new nation of Israel because of my, my pastor's pastor, uh, J. Frank Norris. <laughs> And see, when that thing happened, that radically changed things. And that's why, like I said last week, too, John Edwards and a lot of these old Puritan writers in America, when they got freedom to find the right without a Catholic church killing you for it, they wrote a lot of great books, but they didn't write anything about uh, the Jews reinheriting their land because they knew the Bible spoke of it, but they didn't know how to interpret it. Because <laughs> since 70 AD, the Jews had no land to home, you know. And they just merged in with all the other nations, like God said they would for a time. And they didn't know what to do with those few prophetic verses that spoke about the time when the Jews would be back in their land. And then back there during the, what was it, the uh, Eight Day War or whatever, back in 67, or Six Day War, whatever they call that thing, when the Jews finally got Jerusalem, man, that was a big day. The Jews hadn't, they had the, even when they had 1948, had the land, they didn't have the city. But they finally even got the city. So we have a reason to take great comfort in these words, quote, unquote, what Paul said in the first when he was more about this rapture jazz. I'm a preacher of rapture of the church. And um, so that's why we're discussing this subject. As uh, one of our members have pointed out, they thought it would be good that we discuss some of these things because uh, we may be facing... Christian friends, quote unquote, that question it because we're living in a day where all of our Christian friends don't even have a Bible. <laughs> Can you see why this is important we discuss it? Can you see why the average man that says he's a Christian might totally poo-poo you for believing such a Bible-centered doctrine? Because he don't even have a Bible. He's going by the perverted version of the latest gas bag on the television. Or the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Or the Mormons, or whatever, take your pick. I mean, it's getting crazier every day. And they're all joining together and being federated, you know, <laughs> from one denomination to another. So, the Bible is very clear that the God of the Bible is a God of absolutes. And this God of the Bible, therefore, has spoken absolutely. Now, if you believe that, well, at least now we can, now we can get a little bit closer to being a Christian and being a disciple. Anyway. Tom, Dick, or Harry can say they're saved and believe on Jesus and be saved. But to actually believe more than being saved that Jesus is the Savior, to actually become a real Christian and the follower of Jesus and God and, and to really get into the Apostles' Doctrine, to be truly apostolic, well, that's a whole different ballgame. Because again, you can't if you don't have an absolute. And again, almost all the Christians I know don't have an absolute Bible. So of course they can't believe in the rapture, not no more. They tossed Tim LaHaye right out with their King James Bible. Again, never mind the fact that he did his series of movies and books. He took great liberties that he had no business taking. So, of course, half the stuff he taught me because he preaches in those books is not even Bible. Mm -hmm. But because the Bible does speak all over about a rapture, and, the, and there's many raptures in the Bible, and of course, the Bible really gets excited about this one coming up for the church. 
Uh, and we've got a right to be excited, and, and I'm gonna show you why in just a minute. So, let's remind ourselves by looking at the two most critical texts that speak about this rapture. Though again, again, the reason I got into this study was to introduce people who will watch our videos and stuff of all these other verses that they need to be aware of. Because there's a whole lot more verses than just just 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. But, but if, if that's all there is, it's still not. Mm -hmm. The only reason we believe in the virgin birth is because right. of one verse in Isaiah and one verse in Matthew. <laughs> and that's enough. That's a critical ancient Bible doctrine. Mm -hmm. God's true churches have never had any trouble with it. But they will today. Because they have these Bibles of him speaking about him being virgin. Virgin born. Because they want to make room for everything else. They want to make room for evolution. And you can't be sure of nothing. Because well, which version you got? Which version not oh, well, what's it? And there might be a new one tomorrow. Somebody might find a new homosexual text and you gotta go buy that. Because it's not a whole piece of paper. This is some of the idiocy that's being promoted today. So let's remind ourselves of what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he really gets into it here in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Ah, there's the problem. I hope you've already, we can stop talking right there. That takes care of it. Concerning them which are asleep that you serve not even as others which have no hope. See, some of us have a hope, some of us don't have no hope. <laughs> That's really all boils down to. If you have the hope, then you can continue in confidence to build up your water supplies and ammunition or whatever it is you need to do. Because, uh, you know, what fool wouldn't in the world that's so uncertain is where we're living in today. Because since Jesus promised, in everyone's future, we have nothing but wars and rumors of war. Why wouldn't you want to prepare? You, you wouldn't use the Bible as an excuse to lay back and go to sleep. To be quiet. Whoever suggests such, such things is an idiot. Like my good friend, Ken O. Now that he says, well, oh, I found out there's something that's only been taught for 200 years because a girl stood up at a meeting somewhere and a guy named Darby heard it and he wrote it down and, and then Clarence Larkin picked it up and <clears throat> until then nobody ever heard of such a thing <clears throat> I never heard of these men if I had heard of them uh, they didn't mean nothing to me <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going by what I believe because the Bible said so you know what I mean? we don't go by what men say that's a Catholic tradition we go by men and church fathers and yet the Bible speaks about loving men that are spiritual and so these guys betray themselves pretty easily. So Paul continues. Why is he dealing with it? Because he wanted these people to know some things about those that are asleep and about the resurrection body. That you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Paul constantly used these kinds of terms about how we can be comforted because though it's getting rough and it's going to get rougher, as Jesus predicted it, it would. We know Jesus is coming back for us. <laughs> now, you may want to reject the Bible truth of that, but it's all over the Bible. But these two texts, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, just clearly get into the mechanical details of that moment. So it's fascinating that Paul would take such time to explain that part to us. But we're going to show a few more verses just to show you how. In all of his letters, Paul dealt with the thing because Paul wanted his followers to be encouraged in the Lord. And he wanted the early churches to be encouraged in the Lord. To know that no matter how hard it could get, and it got real hard. There was ten, not nine, not five, not eleven or twelve, but ten consecutive Roman persecutions of the church. That reminded the Jews putting the Romans up there crucifying Jesus Christ, that was pretty bad. <laughs> but yet, of course, knowing God, it all worked out for the good. <laughs> and of course, the princes of this world wouldn't have done it if they'd realized how much they were helping God out. But, you think the Roman government just went back on vacation then after that? 
and it was smooth sailing for God's churches? Of course it was not. And so like Jim Carroll, there's our wall chart, The Trail of Blood by Dr. Jim Carroll. So like this chart shows you, yes, when the early church was going, and he tells you in his little book, The Trail of Blood, he gets into every one of the ten persecutions of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire tried to stamp out all these Bible-believing Christian people that were making copies of Paul's letters and copying them and copying them and making copies of copies and then handing them out and people taking their own copies home with them and then them sharing it with other people and so slowly people even sharing it in other languages because always God's church is interested in promoting the Word of God and making copies. And so like we've shown you another thing about the Bible truth of that old ancient doctrine that it was John the Baptist. It was John the Baptist, of course, was the first martyr of the church. And of course, when Jesus was crucified and left his church behind and the Holy Spirit behind and the Word of God behind, of course, God used John the Revelator then to seal up the words, like he said in Isaiah, that he'd have his disciples seal up the book. And so we believe it was John the Revelator himself who put together the canon because the early church fathers, when they wrote, they always put together the New Testament just like we read it in our new in our Bible here. And of course, the Catholic Church wants to take credit for their Council of Nicaea and all that of putting together the canon of the scriptures and saying, if any man don't believe what we believe, let him be cursed and asthma. Because, uh, and they would curse Jesus Christ, they would curse all the apostles, they curse everybody who would accept Bell the Dragon and uh, uh, Tobit and these other Maccabeans and all these other books they wanted to add to the Bible, which we know is a total joke. But, uh, so God used even John to write the last book of the Bible and to assemble the Bible so that our New Testament starts with Matthew and it ends with Revelation. We believe it was John, the Revelator. John, the probably the youngest disciple, the one that leaned on Jesus' breast, that same John, to put the Bible together so that sure enough, we have the New Testament here and then the order it set was set there by John himself. So, and I don't have time. Of course, I have the paperwork. I have it in my briefcase uh, where I can show you the early church fathers, how they all understood that and believed that, but yet you cannot find that in any books because no, everybody wants you to believe the Catholic way. It's all done. There's this brainwash. There's this deceiving and being deceived that the Bible speak, speaks about. This becomes the trademark, the trademark of our day with promoting our new Christian bookstore, you know. Everything that's except absolute truth. So will I continue before I so really interrupted myself. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we, 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 so Paul was including himself, which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, which we know is Michael, that's the only archangel in the whole Bible. So see, you speak very dogmatically because that's dogmatically all the Bible says. And with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. <laughs> I don't know what else you would call it except what Paul calls it in chapter 5 and verse 3 when he calls it escape. Now that's what I want to kind of zoom in on this second lecture on this preacher of the church. Probably the best Bible word for it is an escape or even uh, another word which we'll show you in a minute what the Bible word is here. Because again, some people want to just get take offense at that word rapture not being anywhere in the Bible. Well, rightfully so. <laughs> See, that word rapture is not in any Greek New Testament text, but it is in Jerome's Latin moly. Did I say Latin? Jerome? Yeah. Or Roman Catholic Father? <laughs> yeah. That's the only reason why. He used the word rapturo or rapture, you know. So, 
So it became popular in theological circles, see, to call it that snatching away, that violent catching away uh, that was used in the Latin text, in the Latin translation. But we'll, we'll try to stay with the Bible since we're Bible-centered right here. Amen. Mm -hmm. But when we say it, though, there's no mistake in what we're, what we're saying. And that's why already people have, you know, you, you put on a little light at night, guess what? Every bug in the county comes to your light. <laughs> Every creepy crawly thing you can think of comes. And so by using this title that Joy's used, of course, we're getting some response, which is fine. Because, uh, again, people need to grow up and learn some things. Uh, especially if they're so naive to not understand these simple truths um, that are so Bible and absolute. So we talked some about these things last week. Verse 17. So after the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now there's no other way you can get around it. And it's clearly a flying through the air meeting somebody up there in the air, and then we finally go off with the Lord. So the old-fashioned songs that we've sung in these churches for many centuries and years are true. That there's going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by. And instead of an airplane ride, there's going to be a plane air ride for his believers. Paul said so right there. Flying out of this world like Superman. And coming back riding like the Lone Ranger for Revelation 19. Okay, in the clouds, we Lord in the air, and so shall we, 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 we ever be with the Lord. Now, Paul understood that he would be going with them. So you cannot believe in it, and you can believe the lie of Alex Jones on this subject, but I think I'm going to stick with somebody I think is a little more spiritual, the Apostle Paul. <laughs> and you see why I call it ancient? <laughs> this is not something just taught 200 years ago. It's been taught ever since Jesus uh, left his church here on earth and the Apostle Paul got saved and ended up becoming a missionary out of the church at Antioch when they first were called Christians. Mm -hmm. They weren't first called Christians in Jerusalem. Wherefore, 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 when you see a wherefore, find out what it's there for. Comfort, 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 comfort one another with these words. Now, again, these clowns today want to somehow make it into a cursed, cursed, cursed. Are you, if you believe in a rapture? No, no, comfort. You believe in this great escape. And that's what Paul says here. That's why he says this is something you should comfort one another with. So this is why, this is what the church has done, too. This is what the church has done. Now, again, these guys want to deny all this history of an early church that was living immediately under 10 consecutive Roman persecutions. What would you think if you're a believer in Jesus, Jesus leaves you, he flies off in the air and leaves you behind, and now he tells you to take this gospel in all the world, and everywhere he goes, he's with you all the way, even to the end of the world. So you don't have to worry about going to the, to the wrong place. The only thing where, where you could go to the wrong place would be going to the moon, and the moon, there was no NASA program back then. So you were supposed to take it everywhere in the whole world. There was no end to the world that you couldn't go, that he'd be with you right there, helping you preach that gospel and get somebody saved. And it would be, be difficult, man. You're going out among headhunters. You're going among barbarians, especially up around Germanic tribes. And, you're going, man, you, it's going to get rough on you. Because a lot of people ain't wanting you to come in here teaching your stuff. Mm -hmm. They want to hear about your God that's only one God. They got their gods that are happy. And you tell them there's only one God and he, and he already sent his son. Man, that's, a, that's quite a cock and bull story for them to believe. And so you're going to get persecuted. And then when the government, when the wonderful world government that you're living in starts coming after you, because they say, yes, this is not good to, we want certified religions of the government. This is a new religion we will not certify. We don't think any one man has any one right to one religion. We think you've got to be open-minded and accept all religions. Does this sound familiar? This sounds like what America believes is a government. They, don't, they hate Christianity today. They're going to continue to hate us because we've always said there's only one God and one Lord Jesus Christ and one way to heaven. And they want you to say, oh, no, no, Jesus is just one of many ways. In fact, to prove it, we're going to overrun the country with Muslims. 
And those muslims will be trying to kill each other and if you get in the middle, ah, too bad. <laughs> and so they're trying to force this new world religion down our throats. Of course, the Pope's already making great accolades to say, well, we'll just join everybody under us. <laughs> and he accepts everybody as his brother. He's already said the new Pope had. So we're right here where the Bible says we'd be in the last days. So it's quite exciting. So there is a new persecution coming, and as it comes, Paul is telling you, you'll be comforted if you can believe this thing that when the Lord comes, he's bringing our dead loved ones with him, and we're going to fly out of here, some of us alive, because not all of us will be killed by these enemies that are coming. But I hope you got a gun. I hope you got a sword. If Jesus told them to have two swords, and there was 12, there was the uh, 12 apostles, then out of every 12 of us, every, absolutely every two people ought to be armed. To be carrying a gun. And Paul said, this, is a, this, this is a, should be a comfort to you to know that this is happening. And so he warned us in chapter 5, verse 3, but when they, see, not us, they, some people ain't going with us. <laughs> when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, 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 you know, Obama <laughs> and all his women that are in uh, office with him. They're running the government and running the army and running the navy. And prevail upon a woman with child, and they, they, they shall not escape. See, we escape, they don't escape. Now, this is what's been popularized as the pre trib rapture of the church. And uh, it's coming, it's coming. And again, it's been taught throughout history. But again, these poor fools that want to reject it, make fun of it, just don't know any history. And they want to believe this latest thing that Ken Hovind's come up with, and now he's written his own book. I wrote to the brother uh, Don Boys, you know, I said, Brother Don, you seem to get on all these talk shows and stuff, and uh, you're not too much afraid of controversy. Uh, have you by chance written anything about this subject? <laughs> he said, well, Ken Hovind tried to get me in a discussion of it on the phone, and I wouldn't let him get me. And, uh, and of course, we know why, because, of course, Ken Hovind figures if he can lamb blast the great mind of uh, brother Don Boys and he'd have a feather in his hat but uh, Don's not going to uh, give him that privilege yet apparently but we know Don were in many just meetings with him and he just wrote a, a new uh, article on the internet today about standing for God's truth and so we know his position and we have the same position so uh, I'll look forward to someday him Publishing a book on this too, like I told you, I started one some time back and got about halfway through it. And maybe with this, I'll finish it. To, to it was encouraged me to look at it, and I haven't looked at it yet. <laughs> so, uh, so I wanted to speak to you about these things. Uh, and notice Paul's word again that this thing should be a comfort. The, the idea that you're going to be taken out, you'll not have to sleep. You'd be able to be going up through the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. See? There it is, black and white. Now, I don't know what the perverted versions say. I don't read on them. You know, so, but no doubt there's, I'm sure, a lot of relativity in it. Since when it comes to Genesis, they don't want you to believe in evolution. In Genesis 1, 1 and 2. So let's continue now. I'll go back over here to 1 Corinthians now. And remind ourselves of chapter 15 again when Paul continues to discuss this. But now this time he's not writing to the church of Thessalonica. He's writing to the church that was started there in Corinth. And here, when he discusses it now, he gives us a little more insight. In verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. Now again, like we mentioned last week, see, there's some people, it's a mystery. They just can't get it. Because Paul explained earlier in 1 Corinthians that yes, we're stewards of the mysteries. And see, they're not stewards of the mysteries. That's why they can't get it. That's why all they can do is mock and make fun. Alex Jones is another perfect example of someone that's not a steward. He's not a steward of the Word of God. Again, he might be saved. He claims to believe in Jesus, and that's great. Anybody can be saved. It's not that hard to be saved. It's pretty easy. But not to be a disciple? Oh, no, that's totally different. To be a Christian? Oh, no, no, no. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. So for sure, 
There's a day coming. Not everybody's going to be dead. Especially if we believe in Jesus. Some of us will be alive and totally escape this world. We'll get a new body. And not have to go through that process of dropping down under the ground and popping back out again. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trump at shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Again, because of this contaminated Bible version, baloney, you got these clowns today thinking, well, that means the last trump of the seven trumpets are put on paper. No, it doesn't, idiot. He didn't say the last trump of the seven trump of the seven trumpets of Revelation. They want to read into it something that's not there. But see, this is another problem. One of the first things you learn when you go off to Bible college is it's easy to start your own denomination or your own church even, uh, or your own 501c3. You know, get you, you know, spaghetti strainer, put it on your head. And, uh, walk around saying it's your religious conviction. Because you go to the Bible and you just try to find something that matches what you want it to say, what you believe, like we said about the Mormons teaching. Uh, shall we be baptized for the dead? So then they come up with this baptism by proxy. Uh, we'll baptize people in our basement and have them say, my name is Charlie Brown. Okay, Charlie, now you're going to heaven because we baptized you in our Mormon church. And that was my great, great grandpa. He you know, died many, many years ago. But now he's going to heaven because we've had somebody pretend that they were him. And I'm, How stupid. But this is the Mormon church. And they try to go in the Bible. So see if we can find something and start our own new thing. We'll get our magic underwear and put our Masonic symbols on there. Man, we're really cruising now. Look at all these suckers we got. Man, all the money we got out here in Utah. You know, and, you know, we got a lot of them. Yeah, they're almost second to the Catholic Church as far as being the biggest cult in America. And yet, we went back in these clowns are trying to convince Christians to believe, oh, no, we think Jesus like you. We're just Christian. You know, what a joke. The pearl of great price ain't in my Bible. The Book of Mormon's not in my Bible. Morani the Moron's not in my Bible. It's almost like you gotta be dumb on purpose to get suckered in with names like that. It's like Joseph Smith was laughing at somebody. I'm sure he was, I'm sure he is tonight in hell. So Paul said, in a moment, speaking of an eye, at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound the dead shall be raised in corrupt, and we shall ready to get. Here he goes again. We, we, we all the way home. We shall be changed. Paul was looking for something to happen. He was thinking maybe he might even make it to be one of them that's alive. And I bet you it's because, like he says in verse 7, I mean chapter 7, he's because of this present distress, quote unquote. Why is he running around as a single man preaching the gospel? I mean, he said he had power like Peter to run around with a wife if he wanted to. But why was it he even told them people, man, it might be better if nobody gets married because of the present distress? See, it was starting already. I remind you, Paul's going to die a martyr's death. He's not going to die of old age like John the Revelator. Mm -hmm. We shall be changed for this corrupt what must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. See, this is, this is supposed to be a comfort to you. Know that in the midst of all this trouble and people dying and people getting killed and being persecuted even and being martyred and having their heads popped off and baptized to death and burned in fire, man, you're going to heaven now. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? That's why he called it a comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words in 1 Thessalonians 4. Mm -hmm. This is be a, supposed to be a comfort. And believe me, if you've ever read the, you know, the Martyr's Mirror and some of these things that we've promoted here in our church, being an Anabaptist church, you know that, yes, our forefathers did embrace it. They did kiss the shackles that they were bound to and kiss the stake they were burned on. They did, and you know, the history is replete with the stories of, 
of the, the cloudy days when the man looked to heaven and said, Lord Jesus, shine on me. And all of a sudden, shoo, sure enough, the clouds open up, shoo, a ray came down from heaven. And so the man couldn't even look up in the morning. He had to turn his head down just before they burned him at the stake. Because the Lord Jesus did shine down on him. And them all of them Catholics standing around, went, you know, they saw that. They testified that they had a good confession, the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 11. These people proved they were God's people in how they died. And they took comfort. I told you the man, that they came to him and said, is it true? Is it true? What do you think? What do you think? I mean, in just a matter of hours, he's going to be burned at the stake in the morning and it's night. And his friends came to him and he's down in the priest's cellar, the dungeon, you know. And he, and he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it true? Is it true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, God gave them what's called dying grace. He said, look at this, look at this, guys. So he took his finger and stuck it in the flame of the candle that was their only light source in that cold bed of the priest. And he burned it all the way up to the first knuckle. And he didn't cry out. He didn't say, oh, he just he burned it all the way down. He was ready to go. There's that thing there in First Corinthians, or I mean First John chapter 5 and verse 8 that nobody talks about. I don't know if his forefathers talked about it because they knew what it was talking about. They were, they were living it. They were living it. And they comforted one another with these words. They were looking for Jesus to come any day. And whereas they all the dead would be raised, those that are happen to be alive would be changed in moments of thinking of an eye. thing of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. What's he talking about? So there's another name for it. You could call it the escape. You could call it the victory. That's a better name. I like that real good. Don't you? The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So no matter how much your persecutors will tell you, ha, 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 we burn all your Bibles, ha, 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 we burn all your books, ha, ha, ha. there's no history of anybody teaching your doctrines of what you believe. It's one of the favorite lies of the Catholics they put on us Anabaptists all the time because they're the ones that burned all of our books so we know we can't prove mm -hmm. that there really was a group somewhere in the Swiss Alps called Hardenites or whatever you know? and so they said oh historically we can prove that we're the oldest church we've been <laughs> you're, not, you're just old, cult, oldest cult you ain't even a church the Anabaptists didn't leave the Catholics it's the Catholics who left the Anabaptists you can bring a lot of doctrinal beliefs and what the Bible says. So, so what is this comfort? See, what is this comfort? What is this victory that Paul's talking about? Let's see if he might have referenced it and, and said it in a little different ways in different times. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 10? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Do you remember Paul saying this in 1 Corinthians 10 11? Now, all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Paul really believed we're living here at the end of the world, people. Now, we know, we look at it, we, what, 60, 70, 80, 90, 80 is the end of the world. We think we got to run. And we know we're at the end of the world by now. <laughs> what is it now? This is not 60, 70, 80, 90, 80. Now we're 2016, 80. Is there any doubt? Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed? The Bible says, doesn't it? It says that. Yeah. What's it talking about? If it ain't talking about this. Some people are pretty dense, but again, again, I don't know what the new version say. They must water it down all the way through so that they totally miss it and can't get it. And they think we're funny. And they laugh at us. They think they're they've got some Bible reason to reject this Bible truth. Let's look at Philip. What did he say in Philip? Now, here's this little tiny church, about 35 people in the little church town of Philippi. Let's see what he says to that little church. Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say rejoice. Huh? Rejoice. 
Verse 5. Let your moderation be known in all men. The Lord's at hand. Now, what was he? What, what are you talking about? Though? No, he ain't. What's wrong with you, Paul? Have you been transported to the future and somehow you believe some doctrine that nobody ever taught until 1840? Come on, Paul. Don't be so stupid. No, no, Paul believed the Lord was coming. In fact, he said the Lord said, hey, you know, that he's coming. He says, I know the Lord's coming in a hurry. He's coming real soon. So these guys want to laugh at what Paul wrote. But again, I'm going to side with Paul. This is an ancient doctrine the Bible consistently teaches. And they all look for the Lord to come in. And that the dead people would be raised and the alive people would be caught off like Superman with them. And they all go flying and literally physically out here because Jesus' resurrection was literal and physical. But that's right, that's the new version. Of course, the new world translation that these actual witnesses wrote that Bible to brainwash everybody. Oh no, Jesus only rose a spirit creature. See, they don't believe in a physical resurrection. And so what else are they going to do with these perverted versions that they all use? Because of course we know that Joe Witnesses Bragg are using the same Vaticanus manuscript. Of the other, the other new versions are taken from. So, see, only in a King James Bible. And there was a time the whole Christian world accepted the King James Bible and used the King James Bible. And that's why this doctrine was very well loved, always promoted. But now, with the advent of the new versions, now we got all kinds of clowns that say, Oh no, you gotta be stupid. There's no after, that's a lie. And the people are falling for it left and right. Yeah. I should say, they wouldn't be falling for it if, number one, they still believe the old Bible truth. That God made the world the center of the universe. Mm-hmm. And then later on, when Darley, Charlie Darwin came along, said, Well, the truth is, man come from monkeys. Then these same theologians says, Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe God used evolution to, <laughs> to make man in his image, and we were really made from an alien somewhere. <laughs> because, you know, I was talking to some ghost the other day. The ghost told me. And so half the stuff people watching on television know these ghosts and the paranormal, and they believe anything the paranormal tells them. <laughs> like there can't be anything like the King James Bible says, a familiar spirit. <laughs> so I can see why we may be light years ahead of some people. And some people may be light years behind us. Let's leave what James said. Let's not let's go on now to another one. Let's go to Jesus' brother now. Of course, we know uh, the, the Apostle James uh, didn't last too long. They cut his head off. So pretty soon, uh, James, the Lord's brother, stepped to the plate. And since I'm sure he took good care of Mary and his family after Jesus was gone, uh, he ended up becoming somebody you know, somewhat in the church, according to the book of Acts. And so let's see what he said in chapter 5 and read what he said here in verse 9. See if he believed the same kind of thing. I bet he did. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. (laughs) Man, he so much believed what Paul said about Jesus coming back. And, of course, he read the book of Acts there and seen what Luke had written there. So that James is saying, man, just like my brother stood up when Stephen was stoned, I believe he's standing up right now fixing to come back, boys and girls, because we know he's going to come back. He told us he was. Over and over he told us in his preaching and sermons he was. And Paul's told us he was. And his apostle, that young man John, that I've known for many years, has told us so. This is what James said. Now again, call him a liar if you want to. I'm going to side with James. That's all. Paul, James, Jesus, when he said he's going to prepare a place for me and he'd come again and receive me into himself that where I am, where he is, or I may be also. I believe all that. I didn't believe it. I ain't going to call it a lie. <laughs> you know, it's not my problem. It's somebody else's. And let's see here. Let's see what John, the old revelator, had to say in 1 John chapter 2 when he wrote this letter. 1 John 2. And pick it up at verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. You know, we know, we read, we wrote about it in Revelation chapter 13, John. Well, even now there are many Antichrists. Whereby we know that it is the last time. You think you got them, John. You should come here. We show, we, we show you the internet. There's zillions of them now. They claim to be Baptists. I mean, what a joke. <laughs> There's all kinds of these self-conceited, anointed uh, Crazies with their messianic congregations and thinking somehow they're following the Jewish Jesus, you know. Of course, that's why they crucified Jesus. He wouldn't keep the Sabbath, so he definitely wouldn't qualify. 
So again, uh, what is this talking about? Why are they trying to encourage people and knowing that the Lord's coming soon? And of course, there's this big due day like Christ coming someday, but yet, wow, there's all kinds of them then. Whereby we know, he said, we know we're living in the last time. Now, this was way back then. And now it's 2016. You know now your salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So the early church was looking forward to the Lord coming back, man. Now let's look at Matthew 24 to remind ourselves a little bit of what Jesus said. Matthew 24, remember? When he was talking there in the Mount of Olives. And he said in verse 17, Let him which is on the house stop not come down and take anything out of his house. Let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. See, they really took this literal. They said, man, when he comes, it's going to be happening in a hurry, man. I want to be ready. <laughs> The dead people are flying out of here, and I'm flying out of here too like Superman. Though I'm sure they haven't seen my television yet. It's on the TV. Let's look at Luke, chapter 17, in verse 31. In that day he which shall be upon the house top, and is stuck in the house, let him not come down to take away. In other words, Christians were supposed to be living loose in the world, so that when the Lord come back, you're not worried about your junk. You're not worried about your stuff. You're just wanting to be ready. So you can leave it all behind you when you fly out of the world. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. Let him not come down and take it away. And he that's in the field, let 